Welcome to the Practice You podcast. My name is Elena Brower. Together, we'll explore and enjoy content and conversations around mastering transitions. In our relations, our wellness, our careers, our families, and especially in our missions and visions. You are invited to learn and love and listen with me. Welcome to Practice You. Welcome back to the podcast. I have with me today my college friend, attorney, mediator, coach, and co-author of Better Apart, Gabrielle Hartley. So nice to be here, Lainey. Yes. That's my name from Cornell. I'm Lainey. Now everybody knows. <laughs> Gabrielle and I are here to talk about Better Apart. It's a book that we co-wrote over the last few years. It was a big labor of love. We are very proud of it, I have to say. And the implication of the book is instead of unconsciously designing a separation or a divorce that has no basis fundamentally in peace, amicability, respect, we've written a book that will encourage couples who are separating, who have found that it's definitely the time to separate and divorce and or divorce, to do so with five pillars. And the five pillars are patience, clarity, respect, peace, and forgiveness. And yeah, you may be listening to this and you may think, oh, that sounds really pie in the sky for me right now. My ex is doing this ABC and this has been happening for years and it's so horrific. But really, even in the face of super traumatic and indeed horrific events being perpetrated by someone else, you yourself can hold a state of being better apart holding these five pillars close. So Gabrielle, we had so much fun coming up with these. I remember the, the conversations. I remember where I was sitting when we had the first one. And you know, the fact is to teach people about this is a great honor and privilege. Absolutely. And I'm proud of us. Yeah. I also am, especially in, um, as a divorce attorney, there's just so much negativity in the profession. And, um, it was really amazing to bring this forward and to share it with my colleagues who um, have met with it um, a bit with a raised eyebrow <laughs> to begin they? with. Yeah, but um, you know, not the mediators. Of course, the mediators love it, but the litigators and the more traditional attorneys um, are like, "Oh, Gabrielle." Um, and I say, "No," you know, and I, I give them a book and I say, "Read it." And I've gotten calls from many, many of them telling me they really enjoyed it. They understood what I was trying to do. And they have been um, telling their clients about it. So I'm hoping to get the word out far and wide so that more people can give themselves the permission to know that truly they can become better apart. Right. It's funny, the litigators, of course, would not be super thrilled about it because it keeps the book's intent on a very practical uh, scale is to keep these cases out of court is to keep these cases in the hands of people like mediators, attorneys who are willing to work for their, for their pay, but also not, uh, not take advantage of the situation. Yeah, and I, I don't think that the litigators mean to take advantage. I just think it's, it's what they do, the way that they view things as a certain negative um, perspective and viewpoint. And they're not looking typically at the family as a holistic unit and recognizing that all of the chaos that they are part of creating Long after the client is gone from their office and off the therapist's couch, they're still stuck having to deal with their former spouse with their internal narrative of what that relationship was mm -hmm. and the aftermath that it can bestow on the children of that couple. So it's really important. Yeah. And if you're a litigator and you're listening to this, I, I am not talking down. I promise. That's you know, right. This is your work. I'm just saying it's it's one of the imperatives of the book to try and keep these cases 
to two people who are working out what the best next step happens to be in light of the children, in light of the future, in light of what's been passed, you know, to respect the past even. That's absolutely right. And I just want to put another little call out to any litigators who may be listening, um, that if you have a case or an adversary or a client or a situation that you think, oh, Gabrielle is just not getting how this one is going down, you feel free to call me and I will talk you through another way that you could approach this case um, because there is always another way. Let's talk about your history for a moment. You've been doing this work. You've been a, a, an attorney for 20 years now. Yeah, almost 25 actually <laughs> at this point. Yeah. And um, so I started in private practice in Brooklyn um, and then I clerked for the now um, chief administrative judge of all the matrimonial courts in um, the whole entire state of New York, Judge Jeffrey Sunshine. And when I worked with him, I resolved or I helped to bring to a close nearly a thousand trial ready, highly contentious combative cases. And that experience really informed me because as you know, Lainey, when I grew up, my parents were divorced and um, they were always bragging about how wonderful their, their divorce was, and I didn't necessarily see it that way. And when I saw how horrible a lot of people treat one another, I realized that I actually was given a great gift. And um, what's funny is a dear friend of mine from high school um, called me last week, and he said, you know, Gabrielle, you, you talk so much in the book. He, he loved the book. Mm -hmm. And he said, you talk so much about how well your parents got along. And I don't remember it being exactly that way. I remember you complaining a lot. And I said, yes, that's absolutely right. And I, I asked him so many questions. I wanted to hear more and remember more. And I said, it wasn't easy. And it wasn't seamless. And it's often not going to be. But it's still, there was still a container that we grew up in so that my brother and I were able to remain intact and whole people. And I just, I, I want all of your listeners to know that even if your situation feels terrible and your kids are in the middle of it, as long as you are maintaining your sense of peace and your own center and your own dignity, it's going to trickle down to the, your children and they are going to come out okay and better than they would have been had they stayed, had you stayed in that acrimonious environment where you were previously. Mm. I think the whole emphasis that you're placing on this sort of elegant flow from one construct to another is really important to emphasize. Yeah, I've often heard um, judges in terms of um, the child custody, I hear judges saying, oh, your kid is ping ponging between the households. And I take great exception to that personally, as I always viewed my life as I was flowing between my two homes. And it's the same thing as flowing between being married as a family and then being an uncoupled family. And even if your 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 ex was a narcissist and impossible to deal with and you know isn't doing things the way that you wish that they were, you still have the power within yourself to create a safe environment for your children and to hold yourself to your highest ideals. I like that within yourself to hold a certain environment, a certain ecology, a certain way of being will actually have a massive impact on the people around you. And you can test it out even if you're not <laughs> particularly interested or concerned with divorcing. That's right. This is actually <laughs> completely relevant. You know, the whole idea of um, reframing our internal narratives is so powerful. And I, I talk about that a lot um, when I when I work with people individually. So going super practical, for someone listening who is knowing that he or she needs to separate and divorce and they don't know what the next step is, this person is afraid to leave or perhaps, as I've had a couple of inquiries recently, unable to leave due to some sort of financial constraint or other circumstance. They're unable to leave for a certain period of time. How can we advise or offer some suggestion to that person who can't leave, who has to stay, who has to somehow make this a tenable situation before they leave and then will leave, what do we say to that person? So that's a great question and that's a great inquiry, um, Lainey. A couple of things. First off, 
for any of your listeners, if you are in a situation that is unsafe physically or very unsafe emotionally, even if you don't believe that you have the money to do so, I would encourage you very strongly to seek help. Um, there are different organizations that you can look up for domestic violence. And domestic violence, again, does not have to be physical. If your spouse has all the money and you have no access, there are laws that typically will protect you and enable you to have your spouse ordered to cover your legal costs and expenses. So for those people, um, your sense of powerlessness is completely understandable, but there are resources out there. And if you if you need to get a friend who is has a lot of internal fortitude who can help you to access those people um, and resources and get out because nothing is worth being in an unsafe environment. But then to address what I think you were going toward, which is how do you maintain um, your own sense of wellness while you're in a really complicated, unpleasant environment, um, that's where the internal narrative shifting really begins. You know, what we see um, and what we feel and what we hear, it's all based on these internal stories that have been delivered to us throughout our lives. And with some small shifts in what we see and hear, we can start to feel a bit better no matter what our circumstance. And for some people, you may find that you surprise yourself that you don't actually have to get divorced. You know, for instance, oftentimes we are stuck in the blame cycle and we're blaming our partners for circumstances that we have been part of creating. We've been complicit in the iteration that it's become. And when we start to allow ourselves to visualize how we want things to be and truly digging in deeper into ourselves, we can step back from focusing on all of our energy on what's going wrong and start working on what goes right with us. And sometimes by doing that, we can actually shift the dynamic without addressing the dynamics head on. Hmm. Many times I've seen people, helped people, coached people to change their internal state, shift their internal conversation, internal narrative, as you say and watched as everybody around them kind of responds to them energetically without ever having said a word. It's like magic. Yeah. So that's, you know, something that you can do. Another thing is if you've both decided it is for sure finished, but we have to stay together for this short period of time, um, establish some ground rules. I mean, if you're civil with each other, if you can find a counselor or a mediator to work with, um, just to set up, you know, who's in the house when, how things are going to unravel. I work with a lot of couples in New York City who can't just leave their apartment in a second. And so we set up all different kinds of interim living in situations um, so that everybody's okay and nobody's losing their jobs and the kids continue with their year at school, et cetera. In the, uh, in the long view, some something like this is actually – the difference between some sort of short-term perceived loss, which isn't really a loss, and long-term really nice karma. Absolutely. <laughs> when you think about it. So let's go into the pillars. I think that will be helpful. The first being patience. Okay. So um, so patience is the pillar that, from one thing that everyone should know is these pillars do not need to be looked into it in any specific order. Mm. Pick the pillar that speaks the most to you and to remind everybody their patience, respect, clarity, peace, and forgiveness. And I'm very impatient, so <laughs> that, that one went first. And um, what patience is about is taking a big, fat step back and um, noticing where you can let go of some of the tension you're holding in your body and mind. And then you can learn to be more responsive and less reactive to situations or to having to wait for people that the whole situation might just be waiting, you know, and mm -hmm. um, something that I find really helpful is just taking a few deep breaths. I know it's so simple, but in through your nose and then hold it at the top and then 
out through your mouth through pursed lips, just nice and easy. Um, I remember um, having a conversation um, with you, Lainey, a while ago where you said slowest is fastest, and that really bugs me, but it was the best lesson <laughs> through the whole book and this entire um, process. Slowest truly is fastest, and when we allow things to unfold the way they're intended to unfold, we have much better, happier outcomes, and we're not splintering our energy. When I learned that, it came to me from a teacher of mine who's kind of a peer but also a teacher to me. And every single time I practice this, and frankly, I, I practice it with my kid, I practice it in my house, I practice it even when it comes to the last few days of the month when work gets very uh, frenzied, when I do things extremely slowly, almost to the point of exaggeration, it seems that everything gets done much more um, readily, happily, easily. When it comes to patience, the practical side, when it comes to being better apart, is that you are going to have to wait because the court system is deadly slow. The, uh, the process of going through one attorney to another attorney or attorney to mediator to attorney is ridiculously slow. Could you speak to that a little bit? Absolutely. We'll <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, er nothing is quick enough for anybody who's ready to get their divorce. So, you know, the other lawyer hasn't called back. The, the, the law hasn't caught up with the times. I mean, the list goes on and on. And the best thing that you can do is to recognize that the law is what it is. The process is what it is. And you cannot change it. You have no agency over these things. You only have agency over yourself. You are the fundamental commonality. And so the more you can practice patience within yourself, the better everything else is going to feel. Yeah. We have a couple of mantras for those of you who are going through a divorce. The relationship to patience is something that you're going to cultivate like you would a relationship to a best friend. I am responsive, collected, and calm is a great reminder. Just write it down and paste it up somewhere close to you. I patiently allow this negative thought to pass me by. That's a great one. The present moment is the only moment that I can control. Also a really nice one. Let's go to clarity. I think that um, when I was with you in writing the book, I felt like I learned a lot from this section because I didn't realize how the minutia, when it comes to separation and divorce, the minutia are so important because that's where people can make it into a big emotional, you know, tumult. When really, if we have the minutia clear, this belongs to you, this belongs to me, this is what I need, this is what I want, these things help us to get through it easily and kindly. Can you speak a little bit to the clarity aspect? Absolutely. So when um, you're going through a divorce or a separation, your mind emotionally, you're swimming in chaos. And so what you want to do is clear out your emotional brain and engage your thinking brain. And when we do that, we're able to make sense and make order of our priorities. So you do need to get clarity over certain things like your money, your assets, your debts, your expenses, your income flow. But you also need to get clarity over what you really care about. And that's where we talk a lot about getting out of the blame cycle and into the ownership visualization cycle. And when you start to notice what you need, then what you want can begin to trickle away in a way that makes sense. And what's so incredible is very often the things that you're holding on to so dearly and that you're so sure that your spouse really cares about, so often the other person cares about entirely different material objects than you do. I've seen this happen in so many cases. Somebody will come in and they just, they want to keep the house. They want to keep the house and, or the apartment. And they're just sure that their spouse cares about it. Well, their spouse doesn't care at all about it. Mm. But 
They've had so many fights, which were not at all fueled by the house. It was fueled by the upset and the emotion caused by the fear of the loss of the house. So taking a step back again Mm. and getting clear and recognizing patiently that you only have this moment to control and this is what I want and this is what I need, et cetera, can really start to bring things forward in in a practical, reasonable way. Want and need is a very important distinction before we move on because in a lot of cases, vengefulness is one of the most poisonous virtues that you can hold. Vengefulness. Yeah. So people say that a lot. And um, I hear that a lot from other lawyers. My practice, I tend to have really centered people who (laughs) call me. I always have. um, Well, that's what that's the vibration you're putting out there, dude. Right. So <laughs> well, I was thinking when I first started practicing, maybe that wasn't as much the case. But um, yeah, I think that there is um, a big need for revenge when people feel wronged. And getting clear that revenge is not going to serve anybody is the best way to start to get clear into what you need. Get out of their backyard and into your own space. Then there's the conversation around karma. There's a conversation around the fact that revenge is not even a virtue at all. It may seem like one in the moment Mm -hmm. to you if you're struggling with somebody who's done you very wrong. But the truth is for you to continue to perpetrate and perpetuate this sort of negative cycle does literally nobody any good. Not your kids, not you, not womankind or mankind. Nobody benefits in the face of revenge. That's right, it's just harm for the sake of harm. And so to just be clear on the fact that what you need is X amount, this thing, that car, this, whatever it is, and not more. But you know, I've gotten a lot of pushback from lawyers who've said, there are so many women who take less than they need and they they minimize so much. And I'm not encouraging, we're not encouraging Mm. people to minimize but at the same time to take ownership. It's a really delicate balance. Um, there is this sense that if you ask for for what you perceive to be too much, you're somehow greedy. And a lot of people will say, I'm a nice person. I'm not greedy. Well, nice has and greed have nothing to do with one another. Taking care of yourself is okay. So it doesn't mean that you need to create this bare bones budget if you're 55 years old and you've never worked and you need to be supported well you need to be supported that's the way it is yeah I don't I I may have misspoken I'm not implying to not ask for what you need like I think that's important for you the listener for you to hear it's not about not asking for what you need it's about precisely asking for what you need not less and not more right yeah especially if you are in this case like 55 years old and haven't worked and the marriage is dissolving but you have no means of support until you or if you get a job unless you get a job i think that's a really important distinction that person needs to ask for support and one thing you can be clear about is you put a lot into that marriage presumably your spouse couldn't have achieved all that they achieved without your contributions, and that's all real. And so get clear on your value. Your value is is worthy. Mm. I want to put a highlighter on that, just making sure that if you're listening to this and you feel like you have absolutely nothing, your spouse, husband or wife has everything, and uh, you're feeling like you're in big trouble, you did bring a lot of value to the table. And to recognize that is a really important practice. And and what you brought to the table does, in most places, give you the right to get a bunch of that money. So don't let anybody talk you out of it if that is the case for you. There she goes. (laughs) With the snap and wave. (laughs) Dude. Oh, my favorite, Legally Blonde. Oh, my God. That's so funny. I just rewatched it again. (laughs) Weren't we watching that in the sorority house? Yeah, because it was the same sorority. Oh, that's funny. Hilarious. Peace is next. Okay. Third pillar is peace. So, God, I'm just sitting in that den right now. It's really funny. (laughs) 
<laughs> the third pillar is peace, and practicing peace helps you really reconstruct your separation or your divorce as kind of a sanctuary of possibility. I really like thinking about it like that. For me, it has been precisely that. I now have a friend in my ex-husband that I care so deeply about. I support him. I bolster him. I do whatever I can do for him and he for me. That's awesome. And it is such a special relationship. I feel very, we're very brotherly and sisterly with each other. And I've just found a lot of old photos and there's something so special about how this all went down. So how do how does a separating couple, Gab, see the sanctuary of possibility peacefully in a situation that is not looking peaceful right now? That's such a great um, question. The thing is that even when things don't appear to be peaceful in the moment today, taking the long view will serve you. So the first step in creating space for peace is recognizing what we're talking about is not about fluffy fairies and rainbows and unicorns. It's about getting to a space of neutrality, noticing how things are. And it's like when you're raising a child who behaves really badly and you're trying to modify their behavior, you might say 15 times in an hour, I see you didn't throw any sand in your brother's face just now. Good job. So (laughs) that's not necessarily good. It's value neutral. And it's much the same way with a difficult spouse. When they show up on time, which of course they should always show up on time for a visit, say, hey, you showed up on time. Thanks. Without a sneer, oh, you showed up on time. Just thanks for showing up on time. Value neutral. Noticing the neutral. You could even just say, thank you. When they show up, they walk in and just be like, thank you. Right. You know, like really. As long as there's no edge to it. Exactly. Kindness in your eyes, like you mean it. Because I, and I want to circle back to my family and my, my friend's memory that he shared with me over the weekend. Um, now it's nearly 40 years later and we have all kinds of holidays together. In fact, when my father nearly passed away two years ago, my mother is the person who helped to find him, his rehab places. She set everything up. And when he woke up, the weirdest thing was after two months of being in a medically induced coma, he kept saying something over and over to um, the nurses, a string of numbers. And they said, what are these numbers? And I said, it's my mother's deceased parents' home phone. <gasps> and he forgot that he, he's been divorced. They've both been remarried. He thought, he, he said, where's Ruth? He wanted my mother. Where's Ruth? I'm going to Ruth's house. Then later, I said, my grandparents had died. And he cried about that, which was not oh, funny. But, and then, but then reality set in and he said to me, if anything happens to your mother, I get Terry. He's a great guy. <laughs> her, wait, her that's husband, her husband. Her husband. Now he's got, yeah. Now oh. he's back with a girlfriend. But anyway, my point is, it, you have to take the long view because my mother was definitely the really peaceful one and my father was definitely a character. And still is. <laughs> he still is. Girlfriend is younger than I am. Um, <laughs> exactly. Three deep breaths. Well. Wow. So um, by prioritizing developing an internal peace practice, you're allowing yourself to recognize that this moment is important and it's only a moment and it will pass and more moments will come. And as you said before, you're going to reset the stage and recalibrate how everybody interacts with one another by choosing how you respond. And I think to emphasize too that your commitment to peace is both a very deep power that you hold in your body and it's also a practice. It's not a weakness. It's not a liability. And, and about practice, let me just say something. Yeah, yeah. Um, and this goes for all of these elements. Just deciding to do it once is not going to help you. Whichever element and whichever practice you choose to take as your own, you need to do it regularly so that it's a habit. Because if it's not a habit, when something comes up that makes you feel agitated or upset, it's going to be difficult to access. But 
if you develop a mantra, for instance, I say, I am radiantly calm because I'm like the farthest thing there is from calm. So I, when I practice yoga four or five days a week, I breathe in and out. I am radiantly calm over and over and over. And then when something happens, I'm not even thinking about thinking I'm radiantly calm. I'm like, hmm, I'm radiantly calm because it's in me. And so if you find that you don't feel peaceful, hmm. pick a peace mantra and say it and live it. And when you can't be it perfectly, that's okay. You're a person. It's just, it's aspirational, but these are habits that we can truly integrate and slowly over time, they become part of who we are. They become part of our fiber. I like also the idea of just creating your own little like mantra for yourself, whatever it happens to be around the concept of peace. That Absolutely. feels important. And you are weirdly radiantly calm now. <laughs> no, for the most part, you're different. It's all that. It's, um, it's no. good to know that that's been your, you know, it's working. It, Res it, it works. It's like true stuff. Yeah. Respect is the next pillar. And this is kind of, I think, the most important one. It, it's self-respect. It's respect of the other. It's respect of your in-laws, your children, everyone in your space who seems to be somehow, you know, against you, respecting everybody doesn't mean agreeing. And it doesn't mean you have to be nice where niceness is not appropriate. It just means having respect for the presence of everything in the space, taking ownership and, and giving people their due. They're that, here. Th that's right. But, but I'm going to suggest that we start with respect for yourself. Please. And... Because when you're going through any difficult time, really, but a separation or divorce in particular for this conversation, there is still so much stigma and shame surrounding the concept of divorce. And I am on a mission to smash that stigma. It impacts approximately 50% of all people, which means half the kids in school or, or more because they're siblings are divorced or their parents are divorced. There's my Freudian slip, but it's true because it's the kid changing the house, not the grown up, right? So, Cutie. Um, so when we don't feel good about ourselves, then we are passing down this legacy to our kids and it stays with us intergenerationally by our set of beliefs about ourselves. So it's really important, especially if you have kids, it's important for you even if you don't have kids, but especially if you have kids, that you work very mindfully on creating a respect practice. And a really simple thing that you can do is to create stronger boundaries. I talk about my grandfather's quote, which is, never throw anyone away, just put them on a shelf. <laughs> never throw anyone away, just put them on a shelf. Thanks for that translation, yeah. So, uh -huh. <laughs> so, um, and... And um, Lainey likes to sing, accentuate the positive. You want to give a little singing? No. <laughs> accentuate the positives, eliminate the negative. That's right. So what, what I'm talking about with that, what, what, we're, what we want to do is create a list of people, circumstances, activities, thoughts that lift us up and spend more time with those things. And if you're in the middle of the worst part of your breakup and you feel like crap and you're like, oh my gosh, what are these two talking about? That's okay. You can still spend three minutes twice a day writing a list of things that used to make you happy before all this stuff happened. And mm -hmm. then work on starting to integrate a little bit more of that stuff into your life slowly over time. Like maybe that's your habit. Maybe you don't want to, maybe you don't have a mantra. Maybe your habit is just bringing in something that promotes joy so that you don't spend three years of your life living under the dark cloud of the divorce or the breakup or the negative circumstance that is overtaking your life. Because as far as we know, we only have this one life and we want to enjoy it. I actually have a good friend who's going through a really tough time financially, and I was offering him the same kind of uh, suggestion, which is just what is actually going right here. You have a great family. You have people that love you. You know, this will pass. Everything passes. 
So if you're listening and it just feels like you're so mired in it right now, just know it will pass. And while all of this is happening, you don't want to miss all the good things that are happening in your life. That's and, the thing. And, and that focus is your version of self-respect. It's your way of looking to yourself and saying, okay, this is what I respect about myself. This is what's going well. This is what I need to respect about the other person. This is what is, if anything is going well, this is what's going well. And, and put your eyes there. That's exactly right. Cause, and when you develop your own practice of true self-respect, it's going to really trickle around and the world is going to treat you with a greater level of respect. It's just the way the world works. And I know that might sound woo-woo for any lawyers who are still maybe listening in, mm. but it's just, you know, true facts. It, and test it out. You don't have to believe us, but, you know, walk, walk one block with cultivating a full feeling of self-respect. Like, this is who I am, spine is tall, walking straight ahead, feeling fully at ease within yourself. You will notice that people respond to you energetically differently. And similarly, if you're a divorce lawyer who's maybe a litigator and you feel like you have plenty of self-respect, maybe you do that with peace. You know, try to oh. develop your peace practice. Take the case at a different angle than you might have instead of responding in this version respond in the version with the idea that this case is resolvable mm. and start with accentuating the positives around where there are points of agreement because there are always points of agreement i've entered so many meetings where the other lawyer says oh there's nothing to talk about and i'm like ha ha ha, ha. yes there is and we usually settle everything <laughs> right i love i love when you just start laughing it's my favorite it's my signature no but it's real That's no it is funny real part. it's just, it's a real signature it's, it's real <laughs> yeah forgiveness is the final pillar and it's really the gift that you give to yourself i feel absolutely I know that when I was going through it and I started to practice it, I went from being very, wanting to be very vengeful and it didn't last very long that part, but it was a few days, maybe a week. And then I realized, oh, this is one of those big lessons mm -hmm. that I get to practice. All the forgiveness for myself, my own actions for him, for his actions, for the whole situation and how it unfolded. For our inactions. For our inactions, exactly true and again with recognizing your own ownership maybe you're the one who did something that you're not proud of now in retrospect <coughs> but then how you react is going to is the only thing that you can control and it will really pave the way for greater forgiveness for yourself going forward remember that we all have flaws some of our flaws are apparent at first blush. Some people act in a way that's obviously somehow distorted. Other people have adverse traits, which are not so obvious when you see them or meet them. But we all do things to ourselves and to one another that are, that are imperfect. And recognizing your own humanness is a great springboard to begin your practice of forgiveness. Yeah. It's, um, it's the way out of contraction and into a sense of expansion again. Absolutely. And, and I say this quote so many times, but I just love it, which is holding on to anger is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. Mm -hmm. And so if you're the one feeling wronged and feeling that you did nothing to deserve this, which very well may be the case, you may need to forgive yourself for not being able to forgive so quickly. And if you didn't get the kind of apology or if there is no apology that you could ever get that would make you feel better, what you may need to do is to forgive the other person for being unable to adequately apologize. Because by making the mental shift in your mind to forgive, you're going to release something is an energy inside of you that's going to make you feel less good and once you truly forgive yourself and truly forgive the other side that's when your emotional freedom is going to unfurl and release and you're going to feel good and everyone around you is going to feel good there's also the fact of 
Yes, at some point, there was a lot of love here. At some, I mean, usually at some point, if I look back at my relationship or people look back at their relationship, there's there's one critical moment that they can recall where there was some deep connection. And, and even if there weren't um, a deep connection, there's a reason that you went to that person. It may be that that person was really a way out of your environment, and so it got you out of a, a worse environment possibly, mm -hmm. or maybe that person um, mirrored some behavior from your family of origin that you hadn't worked through all the way and now you've worked it through but still that person and so you didn't need that energy anymore but still that person that relationship was important enough whether it was a love connection or not it was important enough and your choice whether or not you're recognizing it as a choice today your your choice to marry one another or to couple one another for a prolonged period of time is important. And walking away from that with a sense of forgiveness for yourself and forgiveness for the other for not being able to be the people that you wanted to be is a great way forward and recognizing that everything is just as it must be. Hmm. And again, I think it goes back to the beginning, no matter what no matter who initiated, no matter what's happening, your inner attitude and inner composure is kind of everything. Absolutely. So what are you choosing? That's right. Tell us about what else you're going to do with this book. I know that you're creating a masterclass. Tell us about that. I am. So there, we're, we're launching to begin with a masterclass based on the five elements cool. to get you in and through, and it's going to come with a live component where there'll be a group call for people who want more. And I am still, of course, offering one-to-one -one coaching, which you can access me through gabriellehartley.com and mediation services. I'm still a practicing attorney, but my law practice is limited to out-of-court resolution, both in New York City and in Massachusetts. Wow. I like that you're limited to out-of-court resolution. I do too. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. So, yeah. If, uh, if there is a litigator listening to this who would like to shift gears and move to this, exactly what you're doing, out of court resolution, can they just contact you? They can contact me. And I'm also offering trainings for professionals. But if somebody wants to just have a one-off conversation who is a practicing litigator, feel free to contact me. Again, I can be found at GabrielleHartley.com, and I'd be more than happy to help you um, to move into that more positive direction. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming over. For Thanks being for here. having me. It was a lot so of fun. So sweet. So sweet. And more soon. Thank you. Thank you.